afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the special business meeting for Tuesday, May 8th. Uh, we are meeting today, as always, on the official territory of the Squamish Nation. Uh, motion to adopt the agenda. Moved by Patty, seconded by Ted. All those in favor? Vote. The motion carries. Um, first up, uh, we have the property tax rate bylaw. Uh, moved by Patty, seconded by Peter. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to our business agenda items. First up is a memo uh, that uh, from the Stormers Trails Society asking for a letter of support, and I'll turn it over to the mayor to give some back. Yeah, this is, um, there's no money involved for the district. Um, um, they are just looking to get a grant and would like a letter of support from us, and uh, Christina was nice enough to put together a little memo so just outlining it for council, um, and then I'm happy to move that we uh, provide a letter of support. Question? Um, the letter in the third paragraph, the District of Squamish has been asked to provide a letter of support for the grant application and to commit to an approximate value of $1,000 in kind services for GIS mapping. Does that reflect in the budget? Um, would we have to allot council contingency or something like that to it? Yeah. Oh, I am supportive of that, just not to misunderstand it, but just I, to actually go the path we have to go. Yeah, I'm happy to help explain that, and if I get it wrong, someone will correct me. Um, my understanding is that's mapping work we already do at the Trail Society, so for just for the purposes of the grant application, we're showing our support for the trails work that they do, um, but it's we do that in kind support on all on all the trail stuff they do anyway. So I don't think it's an above and beyond anything that's already budgeted for. Good. All right. <coughs> uh, I believe that uh, letter of support was moved by Patty. Was Did you move it? Seconded by. I'll second. By Doug. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, our next business item is the financial statements and the auditor's report. We'll kick it off with Christine and Mr. Fox from BDO will be joining us shortly. Thank you, Chair Elliott. Uh, Christine Matthews, Chief Financial Officer for the District. And yes, shortly, uh, Mr. Bill Cox from BDO Canada LLP will be joining us um, to walk through the auditor's report. I thought I'd just start out um, thanking um, Corvey Professional Accounting Corporation. As you know, we're uh, actively working on our technology transformation project. We have not been able to find a 100% secondment yet for that project. And so consequently, we've been backfilling with some consulting support and they uh, did a lot to help coordinate our financial statements this year of preparation. Um, I'm going to zip through fairly quickly so that you're able to spend some more time with uh, uh, Mr. Cox, but uh, we'll kind of gauge that with when he enters as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in your agenda package, your financial statements start on page 11. And um, so I'll just quickly walk you through some of the key things uh, that you might want to hone in on there. Um, reminder that these are consolidated financial statements, so they include not only the District of Squamish, but also uh, our Squamish Sustainability Corporation, our Squamish Public Library, and um, I have to always check the reference, 0685492 BC Limited, otherwise previously known as uh, Squamish Oceanfront Development Corporation. So just, uh, this is the last year we'll see that on our book? Well, you'll see a comparative Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not quite like to linger, yet, but yeah. that's right. Um, should be pretty, pretty well put to bed. So on page 13, just a re recognition that uh, these statements do belong and are uh, the responsibility of management of the district. So um, although the auditors do uh, weigh in and pr provide information on whether this is uh, whether they present fairly in all material respects, um, it is, they are our statements and we're responsible for ensuring they're accurate and correct. On page uh, 14 of your agenda package, you actually get into the auditor's report. You will notice that we have been provided an unqualified report, which means that uh, they do consider that our statements are presented fairly in all material respects. Um, however, I will draw your attention to emphasis of a matter. Um, so without modifying their opinion, they do draw their attention to the fact that we made a fairly substantial prior period adjustment, and I'll talk about that shortly. On page 16, 
we have our consolidated statement of financial position. For those of you in private industry, this would is somewhat like your balance sheet on uh, private businesses. It, it recognizes uh, or reflects all the assets, liabilities, and in our <coughs> case also what they call non-financial assets uh, to come out with an equity position. The um, key things to note is that uh, this year our assets have increased and they're better than they were in 2016 and our assets over liabilities have also gone up about $4.7 million over 2016. Um, so that's generally showing that we're in good healthy position. Um, our liabilities are also up 1.9 million, but that was expected. Um, although AP is lower, which again shows that we're managing our <coughs> short-term liabilities uh, quickly and responsibly. Um, the other items are deferred revenue, which is largely driven by our DCC. We consider those to essentially be a reserve, but for accounting purposes, we have to reflect those as deferred revenue. Um, debt is increasing to manage our capital expenditures. Our solid waste provisions by uh, are a legal requirement under regulation and are required to manage post-closure costs for the landfill, so we anticipate that those should increase. And again, that's um, almost like a reserve position. And our post-employment benefits uh, essentially is uh, a contingent liability, or not a contingent, but a liability put on the statements to cover off for uh, accruing uh, retirement and sick leave potentials for all of the state staff, and obviously as staff grows, so will these balances generally. Um, our non-financial assets down below there, um, they are represented by our tangible capital assets, inventories, and prepaid expenses. The inventory uh, you're noticing has gone up, and that's really around the rip rock supply that we uh, secured for diking and management from one of the organizations, so we're inventorying that. Um, to use in capital projects uh, in 2018. And we have some prepaid expenses, uh, software maintenance costs, and insurance that were paid in 2017 in preparation for 2018. For the tangible capital assets, uh, you will note under, uh, as stated in, or restated in note 21, that we have a prior period adjustment. Uh, to break this down, it's basically a $15.3 million write down of our tangible capital assets. 14.2 of them were to do with 0685492 BC limited assets. So um, back when we did the PSAS 3150, you'll remember back in 2009, there was quite a scramble for all of the municipalities to change their public their accounting standards, and we were required to set up assets. <coughs> During that time, there were, we had consultants in the building, and a bunch of people working on trying to quantify inventory and uh, value all of our assets. In that process, it appears that uh, the assets for the SODC, so the land and, and uh, buildings that were held out on the SODC lands, were errantly included in our TCA register, as was uh, $1.1 million of aquatic center um, infrastructure. And the reason this uh, probably happened, I can only suppose, it was 2009, but I suspect that the aquatic center is a very, um, not well-known relationship in that the SLRD actually taxes and um, have paid the debt on that aquatic center infrastructure. So although we insure it and we operate it here, and so it walks, talks, and looks like it would be our asset, it is not, and it's actually recognized up on the SLRD books. So when we went through the various um, pieces of that, we realized that there were some material mistakes, and so we had to uh, do a prior period adjustment on those. Just uh, like proceed? Mm -hmm. Um, how or why did it take eight years to sort of discover? Like through the auditors and through us, and just mm -hmm. so we don't do it again. It's a good question. Um, one of the key things that um, needs to me follow. Um, one of the key issues um, is that our tangible capital asset register right now is very much used only for financial statements once a year. So essentially we're not, we don't have a fully integrated asset management system. It's part of our TTP program where we hope to have a fully consolidated um, asset register with our engineering department and other aspects. So we literally come into it at the end of the year and are scrambled to get year end and run amortization. And once it's set up, there's, we have millions and millions of dollars of assets. So it's not something that we've necessarily gone through with a fine-tooth cone since the last time we did PSAP 3150. When we recognized that we had a problem with the um, SODC assets, 
we thought, ooh, we need to go check and make sure there isn't another. So we actually um, had Corvée extend his uh, time and energy in that area and go through and just look for material misstatements. We fully expect that we will probably, when we go to the asset management project and actually reconcile all our GIS to our financials, we may need to restate our financials again at that point because we'll be doing a really fulsome review and making sure that we, you know, we have that reconciliation. Um, having said that, we do feel that the material um, issues have been removed. Okay, Any other questions? Okay, and I'll just take a moment to introduce <coughs> Mr. Paul Fripp. He is the manager of, uh, senior manager for assurance services out of the Whistler office of BDO. Hello. Hi. So we're just walking through the statements very quickly. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so still on the consolidated um, statement of financial position, we um, now drop down to the accumulated surplus, and I'll just highlight for you note 12, and a reminder that um, when we say accumulated surplus for financial statements, it's not the same terminology we generally use when we're budgeting. And so note 12 breaks it down a little bit more. Uh, note 12 is on page 33 of your agenda, and you'll note that it breaks down between appropriated, unappropriated, equity and subsidies, and um, just so I get the terminology right, the, um, sorry, I guess I'll go there. So I cut that piece of paper. and the investment in tangible capital assets. So the unappropriated surpluses generally are um, available cash to use, and uh, you'll, this has been um, reduced by our internal borrowing. So when we came out to you earlier this year, we talked to you about where our surplus positions were, and that would be more reflective of after the internal borrowing is considered. The appropriated surplus includes um, what we would term our provisions and our reserves. So that's uh, un unappropriated surpluses, but we've designated it for specific uses. And then the statutory reserves, which are um, held by bylaw for certain purposes and sometimes legally restricted as well. And then we have the investments in wholly owned subsidiaries. Obviously, are, that's uh, the equity positions for the library, SSC. And you'll note that there's no longer an equity position for 0685492. Um, question and then investment in tangible capital assets is essentially what we refer to often as our equity and assets, and that's our total asset or our total can tangible capital assets less the debt. And uh, when I say tangible capital assets, it's their net book value, so depreciated value less our debt. Okay. So we'll just move over to page uh, 17 now. Uh, it's a consolidated statement of operations, revenues and expenses, essentially, and again, in private sector, it might be your profit and loss statement. Um, modifications to this schedule this year so that we've broken out what would be capital revenues down in under the other category to give you a little bit purer sense of our operating uh, surplus versus the, cap the um, revenues that we pull in for capital purposes, capital expenditures. The um, operating surplus, uh, the annual surplus over 2016 uh, was over budget and over 2016 and the key drivers for that were development and growth related <laughs> revenues. Change in accounting approach, so um, there's about 500000 just over $500,000 worth of restatement in we reduced a liability and uh, this essentially is a change in accounting approach. So we had um, Previously, the MFA 1% cash balance that we hold, we had always offset it with another liability in addition to the borrowing. And it was based on the fact that there was this liability or potential liability if we ever had to pay that out to help support um, financing for the region. Um, over the years and history has shown us that that doesn't occur. MFA manages the portfolio extremely well in our region is doing fine. So we no longer feel that that's uh, representative or necessary. We already uh, reflect the hiring borrowing liability. So we have removed that liability this year and that pushed another $500,000 towards surplus. Thanks. Anyone's got a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just <coughs> the, um, the annual surplus, surplus before other 3431000 and so forth. So that's the difference between all of our ins and basically our operating outs. Mm -hmm. um, and does that show up in an appropriated surplus? Is that part of the, on page 33, the 4,338,000? Or is that in addition to it? 
No, that's part of the total surplus breakdown that's there. So the, the, the surplus from this statement feeds into the financial position. So it is included in that surplus value. But again, you need to remember that accumulated surplus in this case is a host of different forms of surplus. So um, for instance, we had a, a well, that one's not going to be a good example because we're consolidated, so I won't use that one. Um, but uh, essentially, amortization is included in here, for instance, which is an expense but or for financial statements purposes, but it actually flows to equity and assets, right, or in our tangible capital assets. So they flow to different pots. We have some revenues here that probably were flowed to reserves instead of into operating surplus. So we've appropriated them or used them for other purposes. Um, some of the other well, drivers. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just help. I'm just trying to get in my brain reconcile the revenue and the expenses. So we we had quite a bit of extra revenue. On the expense side, though, it looks like we were one and a half million dollars above our financial plan for our departmental expenses. Mm -hmm. um, no, below. The financial plan said. Ex oh, below. Sorry, you're right. I had to switch my brain to the other. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so below, so that's okay. Um, so there, uh, our actuals are actually all below. Okay, that, sorry, I hadn't flipped my brain from revenue yet. I know, I'm <laughs> seeing it went lined up that way. Thanks. So I'll just carry on down the quick list of some of the surpluses that you're seeing there. Um, so we had the change in accounting um, approach, and then we have uh, some co uh, surpluses on the contract for RCMP. We had savings and landfill diversions, general savings and operations. So pretty well all the departments had some, you know, work came in under budget. Uh, and then we had uh, the use of internal borrowing. So um, we leveraged, so that's one of the reasons you're seeing our appropriated surplus down, mm -hmm. rather than go out to borrowing, so our debt service was lower. And of course, whenever we don't expend fully on the capital expenditures, that also reduces our reliance on debt. Um, that was, um, <clears throat> that was, very um, sufficient to offset any snow clearing and insurance claims increases, which was really the only unfavorable variances we saw this year. Um, developer contributions down and other are the key driver in that area, and we don't budget for developer contributions. So whenever, obviously, there's um, works done through a development uh, subdivision approval process, uh, those come to us and we just recognize them. We don't attempt to budget them. And anything else is really, any of the other revenues down another are really aligned with the fact that the capital expenditures didn't occur at the rate we expected them to. And a big driver there was also the um, Newport Landing um, projects, right? Because we have to be ready and able to deal with the front ender agreements on those, so we do put those in our budget. And if those don't go at the pace we expect, the roads project in particular can have a fairly significant impact on our capital expenditure review. So the um, page 18 is the um, consolidated statement in net financial assets. I won't spend too much time here. I do want to make use of Mr. Cox's time while he's here. And um, so I'll just quickly say that uh, essentially it's showing, the statement shows that we have sufficient surplus when we consider other um, non-expense type items, so our non-financial um, expenditures. So you'll see here they make some adjustments for can we handle our capital expenditures, if we pull amortization back out, which is considered a non-cash item, and there's various um, adjustments for how we deal with gain on sale versus proceeds that we receive on disposition, and some minor changes um, in uh, inventories and prepaids. Overall, it uh, reflects that we are in a net financial asset position, which demonstrates financial health for the district, um, and it has improved by 4.75 million over 2016. And finally, page 19 is your consolidated statement of cash flows. This statement analyzes the changes in cash position from 2016, to, or sorry, and from um, 2016 to 2017. First, it considers all of your surplus from the year and adjusts it out for non-cash related items and then it reviews changes in investing, capital, and financing activities. The net cash surplus of 15.2 million uh, was employed for capital acquisitions to the tune of 12.8 million. The district financed more than we repaid in borrowing this year, and there was additional, some minor additional investing. So the net change is six million increase over uh, 2016. 
Um, I won't go into the various statements and um, schedules, although I think you'll note that there have been um, some expansion in these areas, further explanations, and some cleanup and changes in schedules. Um, I will, one final note though, that uh, we have included uh, BDO's final report in the open session in the interest of transparency and open governance. Um, so those start on page 45. I will turn it over shortly to um, uh, Mr. Cox and Mr. Fripp to outline anything significant there, but just a note on page 67, it talks through any recommendations uh, for uh, management from their review and uh, oversight of the audit. And um, we feel that uh, management is actively working on those uh, improvements and or has uh, been planned into our work plans for the future. So uh, we aren't perfect by any stretch, but we're certainly getting better every day. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to... I just got a question here. <coughs> Thanks, Before you can get off that. <laughs> okay. Just one short, a brief question. Um, under uh, operating transactions provision for landfill closure, mm -hmm. uh, 234970. Sorry, which page are you on? Uh, sorry, on uh, 19, at the top of the page. The provision for landfill closure. Okay. And as that isn't happening, curious as to what happens to that. Oh, so each year we do a review yeah. of our um, required um, costs that we have to set aside today to be able to handle our post-closure by the time the landfill closes. Right. We adjust this every year, so it is actually showing an adjustment of 234, so um, we just basically every year we redo that estimate, and every year we adjust it up or down to make that running assessment of what we're going to need by the time the uh, landfill closes, is that? Yeah, thanks. I was trying to catch up on page 31 where the provision for solid waste was, but I didn't get there in time before the question came up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, um, allow you, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Bill Cox, who's now joined us, and uh, Mr. Paul Fripp. And uh, Mr. Cox is the partner for BDO Canada Limited. LP, not the partner, but one of the partners. The most important one. The most important one, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and at this point, to Council, if you have any specific questions, but I don't know if you have something in particular you want to talk through. Yes, um, if, if appropriate, I thought I might uh, run through a couple highlights in our letter that we have for you. And uh, before doing that, I thought I might just mention um, your CFO talked about some of the new accounting approaches and, and uh, uh, changes that there were this year, and I thought it was worth mentioning that uh, that we talked with um, your CFO and, and staff in advance of the audit. You know, were these the right things to do? Here's why we want to do them. Here's here's the logic. Uh, so none of these were surprises when we were doing the audit. So I I like that approach. I think it's a good approach to have that communication during the year, to make sure we're on the same page. We don't get in here and have a bunch of uh, surprises. Uh, and that um, is probably more accounting theory than you ever wanted to, to hear in one afternoon, especially a nice sunny afternoon. But the, the change that um, Christine mentioned in regard to that 1% uh, fund that the MFA has, uh, accounting standards have changed a fair bit over the years. If you went back 20 years or, or so, one of our core principles always was what we used to call conservatism. I know you don't tend to think of accountants and conservative in the same sentence, but um, that was a core accounting principle. So something like this MFA fund, where it's coming back in the future, um, it, it was sort of a good thing to be conservative. Uh, that's all changed. In recent years, the focus on accounting is best estimate of whatever you can get to. So. The change that uh, was made, I think, is a good change and sort of in, in keeping with the way accounting standards are going. So I think that was a good change. Um, I wanted to hit a couple highlights in our letter and apologize for missing the start of the meeting. We have uh, three audit committee meetings today, so it's a good, it's a good day. <laughs> the best thing is I don't think so. <laughs> the best thing is I don't actually have to work. See, this is the, this is the fun stuff. Um, and I realize you want to take a whole ton of time with this, so I just I circled a couple of things in our letter, which, uh, as your CFO said, starts I think on page 45 of the agenda. A couple of things to highlight. 
Uh, first of all, the, the audit work itself. So we've completed 99% of our audit work. Our last little bit of work happens after council approval of the financial statements. So that's why you, you don't have a definitive signed opinion from us yet. We have a little bit of work left to do. That's by design. The last little bit of work happens after council approval. We have a little discussion with your lawyers and some follow-up of uh, council minutes and things like that uh, to do. But we're far enough along, we know there's not going to be any issues and it will be a clean audit opinion. Uh, our audit standards do require that we talk to you each year about this thing called materiality. The, um, one of the problems when you get near the end of a council term is I'm never sure how much I'm repeating myself from last year. But this is one of the things we have to talk about every year, materiality. So the, our opinion on the financial statements will say that we believe the financial statements, which your CFO just went through, are fairly stated. We don't use the word accurately stated. We purposely use fairly because we're, we're doing testing. We don't look at every single transaction. And we set all our testing up through statistics and things to make sure that we're comfortable that the financial statements on, in aggregate are fairly stated plus or minus this materiality amount which we state in our letter, which is a little over a million dollars. I'm probably repeating myself a little bit from what I would have said last year, but uh, a couple of thoughts that go with that million dollars. So first of all, that's set, that level set by audit standards for audits of uh, governments right across Canada. So any local government of, of your size, anywhere in the country, audited by any audit firm is audited to about that same level. There's a little bit of judgment, but about that same level. So you're not audited any harder or lesser than anybody else. Um, also key to remember that if we get into areas when we're working where something doesn't smell quite right, it looks like a potential fraudulent transaction or um, a illegal, illegal act of some kind, then we throw that million dollars up the window at that point and we say, okay, well, we come across anything, even if it's $20, $30, $5, we're going to report it back to you. So even though it, something like that would not materially impact the financial statements, if there was, say, a, a $30 expense claim for the same thing made twice, it doesn't really impact your overall financial results, but it does impact the integrity of people that work here in management and things. So we would want you to know about that if we came across anything. We don't just say to ourselves, oh, it's less than a million dollars, no big deal. Anything like that, we would report to you. And fortunately, we have no such things to report to you. Uh, a few pages later in our letter, you don't necessarily need to follow along. It's page seven of our letter, and I haven't done the math to figure out. Page 51. 51. Um, See if I can remember that, that map. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a bit of a table there we call key audit areas. I don't need to go through these, but the reason why we state them is just so that you're aware that there are some areas in, the, in, in our audit of, of your numbers where we spend more time than other areas. And these are areas, the ones we've listed here, these are areas where there's, uh, there's, there's some estimates or a good volume of transactions, things like salaries, there's a lot of transactions there. So where there's estimates, there's unusual items, or, or there's a great volume of transactions, we spend more time in these areas than others. And this is really for your information, so you see where we have spent some of the, uh, some of the time. Things like cash, salaries, tangible capital assets, a huge um, investment that the uh, uh, as much makes, so um, more time in those areas than others. <laughs> I've forgotten the math already, but on page 12 of our letter, which so is 56. 56, there's a page called Fraud Discussion, and I wanted to uh, explain why we have this here and why any time that we're sitting in front of you, we're going to bring up this word fraud. Part of, our, part of our approach when we're looking at planning the audit is, is getting a sense for what's happened during the year. And if there is a situation where there is some, 
some fraud or, or it doesn't have to be proven, uh, some suspicion of, of fraud in any area, that changes the way we're going to tackle things. So we asked this question of, of management, has, has anything happened in the year, any, any frauds? And in any organization, you know, from time to time there are some, hopefully, immaterial ones, but, but we need to be aware of those, um, where they lie. So um, we asked that question of management. We also are required to ask that question of council. Now, of course, an open meeting is not a good place to have, have that discussion. Um, but really, the reason why I mention it is uh, later in the letter, you have our emails from myself and, and Paul, our senior manager. Um, if anything comes up during the year, it doesn't have to be now. It doesn't have to be if you see us in the fall. Anytime during the year, if you hear something, from a neighbor or in the community that um, concerns you, let us know and we'll add that to our, our audit plan. Uh, that probably covers uh, really the key things I wanted to mention. Uh, your CFO mentioned. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, you mostly focused within the fraud audit if you look at those types of things, or when you look at those, you mostly looking at financial fraud, or are you, are you considering um, time fraud, time stealing? Do you do any of that kind of digging? Yes, uh, all of the above. So, in that area, what we do when we're when we're planning out the audit is we sit down, we have a brainstorm, and um, we're fortunate, I guess, because we do work. I, I didn't give you the commercial. Uh, off the bat, like I usually do, but I, I think the number is something like 45 municipalities that we work with mm -hmm. in BC, a couple hundred across the country. So uh, we're able to sort of pool that knowledge and say, okay, well, what's going, what's going on in, in the world of local government? Mm -hmm. And we sit down and say, where are those risk areas? So those tend to be, you know, they, they vary from year to year depending on what's going on. They tend to be areas where there's there's cash coming in the door. Of course, that's less and less. These years, that's a risk area, um, but time, but uh, stealing of, of time, which is um, you know not reporting a vacation day when you take it or getting paid overtime you didn't really work at those sort of things, mm -hmm. those are also factored into our, our risk areas and, and uh, depending where it sort of rates, which also depends on what internal controls you have there, sort of sets the level of work that we do in that area. But that's important. So uh, so it's financial fraud, it's time fraud. Uh, it's also financial statement fraud, which is the kind of thing that our friends at Enron in the States were doing, where they were making up entities to get transactions off, off the balance sheet, that sort of thing. Um, we look at that here, too, as well. Nothing would, I shouldn't say this in an open meeting, but nothing would make us happier than finding a whole bunch of fraud. <laughs> Bring excitement to your day. <laughs> <laughs> would make me happy. <laughs> um, but um, <coughs> yes, uh, nothing, no such frauds to report. But it, but it doesn't mm -hmm. extend to our contractors and that type of thing, or specific contracts. Would you dig into? No, those? no. Um, certainly, what goes on strictly on their end is we we, are, we don't have the ability to uh, chase. The dollar. If you get into a forensic audit, mm. um, then you can go to court and get access to the records. So we don't have any access to the records. Um, one of the things, though, that was a big deal a few years ago, uh, the Squamish um, was saved from this for whatever, well, for because of good management, I assume. <laughs> um, but there, there was a, a bunch of uh, supplier kickbacks going on, sort of in the industry, and it was. I believe it wasn't really viewed by the companies involved as being illegal until we sort of pointed out to them that it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was things like the person in the works yard that was ordering from the supplier. The supplier would say, "Well, here, why don't you have a free lawnmower? Mm -hmm. You've done lots of uh, buying from us this year. Here's a free lawnmower." And people weren't really thinking that was a problem, but it, it is a problem. Yeah. Uh, so that that was sort of endemic, but that, I think that's you don't see that around as, as much. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it's an area that we do spend some time on, but we you're right, we can't get into the books of this fund. Uh, I did if, if our time is okay. Yeah. Um, uh, 
because the CFO mentioned our, our management letter, which is Appendix D, and I think I have 44, is that right? Uh, page 67? Page 65, I think. 60, ah, okay. <laughs> Getting closer. Not very good at math, which is why I have an answer. Confidence is right. This this letter, and I I was going to ask Paul maybe to speak to highlights. Uh, I don't think we need to get into a ton of detail. Your CFO mentioned already that they really are in process or planning to, to if not already in process, planning to deal with um, points we've raised. But uh, Paul, do you want to give a three-minute overview, sort of what came Sorry, up? Sorry, it's page sixty-seven. My error. <laughs> So Bill was right. <laughs> I will never say that. <laughs> you keep trying. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, pleasure to be here with Council to sort of run through uh, some of our observations uh, arising out of our audit. Um, I want to start off by saying that we have tremendous support from Christine and her team. Um, I think if you look at uh, the unadjusted audit differences and the adjusted audit differences and you compared those to last year, you'll see that there's quite a big difference there with, with uh, what we were adjusting through our, our audit process. Um, so that speaks to the work that Christine and, and her team are doing in the finance department. Um, you know, that being said, we believe that there's always room for improvement. So I'm not going to go through each point in a whole lot of detail because I think that there's a, a lot of information there um, and, and management's uh, response to give you some context to them. Um, uh, Christine already spoke to tangible capital assets. I mean, this observation is really arising out of the prior period adjustment that, and, and Christine acknowledged it, that there's still some, some uh, room uh, for improvement there and, and to sort of look at processes to ensure, uh, uh, you know, uh, the capital assets are being recorded regularly throughout the year and that uh, developed contributions are being captured accurately and timely. Um, but that process is well underway. Um, from a sort of a staff resources and, and then a new accounting system uh, point, I'll sort of lump these together in that, uh, um, you know, we, we, we identified that, you know, there was, what, how, how would I term it, just um, probably that there was just some capacity issues in the department arising out of some of these big projects that are happening. Um, so, know that Christine is uh, Totally aware of this and, and that they're working on it. We we made some sort of uh, some sort of general points as to how you might be able to integrate the new accounting system to create some efficiencies and, and some opportunities to work with existing staff or potentially new staff to to uh, in, increase capacity and in, in existing resources. Um, but um, you know, the, there's uh, obviously. Um, there, there can be some challenges to that at, at times, which speaking from somebody who lives and works in the corridor, sometimes it can be just as difficult as finding the people to do the work. So um, that's really my sort of three minute overview, unless there is any specific questions about any of those points. Um, sorry for arriving late, I put the uh, asset amortization and the tangible, cap tangible capital asset uh, disposition of the $50 million asset that was not, that was just recorded, was that just simply reversed once it... So, sorry, I can certainly explain that again, it was, if, uh, yeah, no, I can certainly explain that again. So what happened was the... Uh, okay. sorry, you don't need to explain it again, I can get it offline. No, that's, that's fine. I'm happy to, because uh, I probably should have mentioned too that one of the reasons that we think that the 14 million for the uh, formerly SODC didn't get caught was that we actually had it in our books as an investment. And okay. then it got set up as a tangible capital asset and then it got that's missed in consolidation because we were looking for an investment. So I think that's probably why that one carried on. And for a while until that one was what alerted us to the fact we had a problem because when we went in and went, oh, why are there SODC assets in our books, right? And that's why we kind of stepped back and went, okay, we need to look at TCA a little more carefully. 
and so we sent our, consult our consultant in to have a more fulsome look and he came back with several pages of things of which we really only identified two that weren't actually correct. They were weird, unusual, but they were correct. And so these were the two that we ended up saying, no, that's, that's a misunderstanding of those assets and they need to be taken off. Perfect, and then the asset amortization, I'm sure you talked about that as well, as well with early, early asset amortization. Oh, so I believe that, is that the adjusting yeah, the entry? Yeah, the Yes, so <laughs> we'll agree to disagree on this one, but. <laughs> um, do, do you, you just picked a, sure, yeah, so. pick a different reason for We have uh, different, different approaches for, for okay. yeah. and part of it That's is a little math. bit of a software limitation too, I'm not going to lie, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, uh, public sector standards would say that, you know, ideally when an asset is put in place, that's when we start amortizing it. Um, uh, Maze, on the other hand, I believe, only amortizes it for one month of the year in the year that the asset's put into place. So, And I don't want to disparage Maze because it's actually our city-wide system, which is where we hold that TCA right. register, uh, so just so that we don't bash poor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, We just transport the information we get off citywide in and the way that citywide was originally set up and because we only put our assets in at the end of the year, yeah. it, it's it not able to make okay. those adjustments back. So yeah. it basically just takes the one month that we put them in in December. Yeah, it's taking one month. So you just take the full amortization in within the one month instead of amortizing it in the process? Well, it's only actually one month's worth of amortization that goes in, which is why we have the huh. error estimation. Yeah. And I will say that it is an estimation only. And the reason that we calculate every year is to make sure that that number is not getting too big. Otherwise, you know, I think it's a fairly uh, reasonable, common sense approach to a software limitation that, that uh, exists within the accounting system. And it's not a material difference. Can that amortization be taken as a full year amortization within the one month as like calculated across and then? Well, you wouldn't want to take the full year either because then you're sitting on the other side yes. of the error. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, part of, you know, I mean, I, I think we would say that a best practice would be to try and input your tangible capital assets, you know, monthly or quarterly. Monthly is probably a bit excessive, but, you know, maybe quarterly so that, that you're sense. getting a slightly more accurate. Is that possible with our software? Uh, through the chair, we are, we are actually looking at this and certainly as part of our asset management program that we're looking at for TTP, we'll look at this more fulsomely. We did explore what it would look like to change citywide midstream. Um, to, we probably would go the opposite way. We, we feel that there's a lot of assets that we actually don't put in pr pr into production until the fall because our construction season is the mm -hmm. summer. So we actually would argue that even taking 50% of the year might be overstating amortization too. So it is a little bit of a, um, that's why we kind of okay. both say, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's an issue, but. That totally seems yeah. um, Thank you for Having said that. that, we are looking at trying to set up our capital mm -hmm. assets uh, quicker through the year and we're working with engineering on that as well. Um, having said that, likely it'll still be heavily loaded into the last quarter of the year, realistically, just because of that construction season. I believe Patty had a question. Having said that is an accounting term, right? Um, <laughs> just uh, another little piece that uh, Council Scrum might have missed was um, you talked about as we do the TTP and the asset management, we're probably going to find more of these things. Probably. Um, as the system gets better and we can evaluate it better. So we may see this next year. Yeah, hopefully not to this magnitude. Yeah, exactly. We certainly don't believe yeah. that there's more gross yeah. misstatements. Um, and a lot of that reconciliation will be for our replacement values mm -hmm. and our long range planning, whereas we'll be trying to keep our book value fairly stable. Um, so, but, but so realistically, warning, when so. we look at GIS and compare it back, we might find some other assets that. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Any other information, Bill or, or Paul, before we go to the closed meeting? I don't think we're uh, not at this we're good. Time. Thank you. Okay. So, um, could I have a motion to close? Uh, moved by Doug, seconded by Peter. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, <laughs> so, we're back in the special meeting uh, Tuesday, May 8th. Um, and our auditors you are here to answer questions. Um, and I believe Councillor Spell has a question. Thanks, Tommy. Christine. 
I can maybe our auditors know the answer. I don't think Christine around. is walking right now. Perfect. I'm going to wait for Christine. <laughs> So I have a quick question again. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering about the amortization, while we were talking about amortization there. Uh, where are we at in the schedule for amortization of our large assets? Are we at the end life of all our, of, of everything we whereabouts? No, um, I think the last time I did an analysis of this, bear with me, was back in June. Yeah. So. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we're not fully depreciated. I we're, think we were probably at least 50%. Thank you. That's all. It's probably around that. For most of our assets. Yeah. Thank you. Council, any more questions for Christine or our auditors? No. All right. Um, motion to terminate. Thank you oh, all no, very much. We, we need a motion. motion, motion. To <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Geraldine. What was that? We need, don't we need a motion to adopt the financial statement? To statements? accept. Correct. To accept. Oh, uh, I have a motion to accept the financial statements. Moved by Patty, seconded by Ted. All those and the auditor's report. And the auditor's report. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now I have a motion to make. <laughs> Moved by Peter, seconded by Ted. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming.